Good evening. This is Tuesday, July 9th, 2024. It's currently 728 p.m. in North Texas and points north and south. And uh, we're going to jump right into this because uh, tonight we have a guest. And here he is. Uh, let me turn off my mic here and make sure that everything is still going according to oil everywhere else but uh hello dave hello welcome oh i need to i need to kill the music i couldn't hear it that's all right all right that'll take care of it <laughs> there we go uh. All right. How are you doing tonight? I am super. I'm excited to be here. Well, I am excited to have you here. Um, so I'm just making sure don't yeah, don't do that. Hmm. Still seeing. Let's see here. I believe that we have no sound. That's, I'm not even seeing image. I'm just still seeing your. Oh, I see it. Okay. Well, let me refresh. I've got it That's, locked. Not... There it is. Oh. Image. I'm just still seeing your. Oh, I definitely have. Sound. Sorry, I, I, I had I had a thing there messed up. Okay. Hey, there we go. <laughs> hey, Skillum. How are you doing? Sorry, I I had something. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. So so you know that thing that uh, on uh, if you have an iPhone, um, you know that thing that you can't get your your parents to understand <laughs> how to how to flip that switch to turn off their their damn phone. The little the little switch on the side. Yeah, I had it. I had it turned off. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so cool, Dave Grimwood Games. So yeah, I guess small introduction for yeah. people who might not know who I am. Please. Uh, so I am a Twitch streamer and game designer. And I've taken, uh, I've designed this game called Grimwood uh, Ironbound, and it is a uh, urban fantasy uh, D12 system that uses a boon and bane system to boost the roll uh, to give you 2D12 or 3D12 or 4D12, depending on how you go. Usually, you don't get higher than four, um, and then you also have a three pool system that the pools are uh, allow you to boost the role use abilities and um 
they're used for health. So it's a matter, it's a management system on top of a role playing system. It's actually quite fun. Hmm. Okay. Well, I like D12s. I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a big fan. Uh, it was one of the things that attracted me to, I don't know if you heard about Coyote and Crow a couple of years ago, but. <clears throat> I do like Coyote and Crow. I forgot they used the D12. Yeah. I mean, Coyote and Crow shares a lot in common with, with um, World of Darkness, the way it works, kind of. But, I mean, it's a dice pool system. But, yeah, D12s instead of D10s. Um, and I, I almost went with dice pool system. I changed my mind. I like dice pools. Um, I think there's some misconception. I th think there was some misconception uh, for the people who were first designing them that, uh, oh, well, you got more dice than, than you. I think our levels are a little high. Uh, you got more dice, then that gives you a better chance of getting a success. And it's not exactly true. If you're trying to hit a target number on a D10 and you you roll that D10 20 times, you had no better chance the first time than you did the last time. It doesn't ramp up. It doesn't make any difference if you roll all 20 of them at the same time either. Correct. And that's why I went with the system I went with was because I was trying to do the same thing. I'm not trying to ramp up. You can get from 1 to 12, and that's all you can get in my game. Right. Right. That's cool. So, uh, so, so um, let's see. Uh, I think the thing that most people think of when they think of role-playing games, and, and I'm not one of them, but let's let's hit the high point. How does your combat work? So combat is quick and fast, and basically how it works is you have a d12 that you roll for, say you're making a, t a single attack, you roll a d12. Uh, if you have a boon to that weapon, you get two d12s and take the highest. Um, if there's, like, say, a shield on the person or there's cover, that cover will affect it by giving you a bane. Um, boons and banes do cancel out each other, so if you ended up with two boons and one bane, you it, it would be one boon, so you'd roll 2d12. Uh, and opposite, if you had one bane and two uh, uh, one bane and two boons, you'd roll um, the same. Right. Uh, so, and take the lowest. Uh, but, uh, that's how combat works. As simple as that. It's it's against a target number of the creature um, or person. Um, all of player characters are a target number of nine. Um, nine seems to be the sweet spot where you you get a, a, a 60, 20, a 60, 40 percent chance of hitting. So that's why they start at TN9. Um, 10s, 11s, and 12s are harder to harder to get. So Sure. Uh, especially with boons and banes. Um, not so much if you're just rolling a d12. It's it's the percentile is the same no matter what. But when you're rolling boons and banes and keeping the highest or lowest, it changes the um, percentile. So TN9 seems to be the sweet spot. Uh, casting magic works the same way as um, melee attacks. You basically you have a, either have a boon or bane to it, and you roll. Uh, the difference here is magic is an open system. I I don't give you a list of spells that you get to choose. You you tell me what you want to do, and I set a target number for that situation. So or the GM does. Um, I that like situation. that. I much prefer that system. I learned that system from Easy D Six and. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of adopted it and changed it a little bit to fit my needs. Yeah, easy D six. Yeah, if you I love that system, there's a huge influence of easy D six in the system. You can definitely see it. Well, good, good, because. <laughs> 
that means it's not going to be complicated to learn. So that's that is a good thing. Um, I was having a. I don't know if you've seen this. There's a there's this. I, I think there was a Kickstarter. I can't swear to that, but there's this five uh, E cheat sheet that I keep seeing ads for on on Facebook and other places, but. I mean, they're asking money for this thing, and it's like six sheets of paper. It's it's a PDF. Shouldn't it be anything? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so they they. Yeah, you need this cheat sheet in order to play the the game, because I mean, five E is very dense. It's not that crunchy, but it's a lot of rules. Yes. Um, that was always D and D's thing until we got the third and, and three point five. Was it's not that difficult to understand any particular part of it. It's just there's so much of it. Mm -hmm. But this woman was asking if this cheat sheet would be great for her eight year old who's just starting out, and no one was answering this question in the in the and I don't know why I bothered to to look at the the um, the comments for this ad, but I did, and there was the question. And I said, "What would be great for a, an eight year old just starting out is an easier game." So let me give you some examples and why I like them. And yeah, I'm not telling you this because your kid's eight and he's too dumb to understand how to play Five E. I'm telling you this because I've been playing for 43 years and these games are better. <laughs> And Easy D6 was one of them. Uh, my my viewership knows that I don't think D and D is the best game out there. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah, I agree. Hey Herman, how you doing? So, um, but the system is uh, very much in the mainstream flow of things. Like I try to keep it simple, but yet I want. The problem I have with these EV6 is I don't feel like there's enough complexity for my love. I like some complexity, but I want it to flow quickly. I get that. So I've added um, basically feats to the characters to give them like level structure um, so that you can have like different abilities based on your feats. Plus one, one rogue one thief doesn't feel the same as another thief or one soldier doesn't feel the same as another soldier. Okay. Um, uh, if you want to introduce East Gillum's put down that he introduced with hero kits, a really good one to introduce uh, yes. is uh, the cipher system one, the uh, not so, say nothing to evil or something like that. Uh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Um, no, thank you, evil. That's no, thank you. Is. Yeah, uh, yeah. DM uh, Wes was reviewed that like a week or two ago. So yeah, yeah, it's really good. Um, I've played with my eight year old with it, and it's he he loved it. Yeah, um, I got so there was a couple that was in my group. And they have since gotten a divorce, and we only have the the ex husband in the group now. But they were getting their daughter into playing, and she was like six, seven, and um, we got her uh, the hero uh, the uh, hero kids game for Christmas one year, and she loved it. They played it about ten or fifteen times, and then she wanted to play D anD. d and so she started playing D and D, and then it's like, well, this isn't nearly as much fun. And by this time, the divorce had happened, and uh, Jay, his name is Jay, also, uh, uh, he uh, he said, well, why don't we talk to Jay and see if he'll run uh, World of Darkness for you? And it's like, oh yeah, I'll do that. So now I'm running a separate storyline with the two of them playing and i mean you've heard some of my stuff i i toned down the violence <laughs> um i toned down all the sexual references and all of that stuff it's she's 12 now 
but uh, yeah, we fully expect her to start playing with the regular group though in about two or three years. Well, she's way mature for her age. I wasn't nearly that together at 12 years old. Uh, my experience is most kids who play role playing games are way more mature than they they appear. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's that. because it teaches you social skills and it teaches you management skills and that type of thing. So, uh, but the um, so my urban fantasy game Ironbound would uh, yes, it's really simple to play. Like I've had people go in to play sessions not knowing a thing. And then I can teach it within five five minutes. They know how to do everything in the game because there's one mechanic in the game, except for a couple optional mechanics that I provide. Um, one of the one of the optional ones is I have a hacking mechanic in there, and the hacking mechanic can be uh, basically the DM rolls three d six and keeps it hidden from the players. And then the hacker, whoever's hacking, has to roll, has so many so many times that they can roll based on the security level of the, of the, of the computer system to get all three digits. So it's a really simple um, me mechanism. It does slow the game down a little bit. That's why I cut, created it as an optional rule, not a permanent rule. Um, gotcha. But I think it works well. Um, that, that's, that's the thing that drew me to the world of darkness. If you can count to 10, okay, we just covered 60% of the rules right there. Cause you just, okay, I need six dice and I need to hit the number seven. Okay. All right. I got three of them. You're good. That's why I liked easy D six was you, yeah. if you know, one through six, you can play easy D six. Yes. So mine is very similar. If you know one through twelve, you can play. Um, play on the system. So. Oh, I'm elderly. J I'm JD elderly. <laughs> Thank you, Herman. <laughs> You're a year older than I am, dude. You need to scale that back. <laughs> uh, uh, Herman is my original DM from 1981. So, yeah, DM Pappy Campbell there. Uh, Skillum, oh. E-Skillum, you could definitely play my game. And in fact, I keep wanting to get you into a game. <laughs> uh, all right, well, tell me about the... Uh, tell me about the setting. Okay, so Grimwood City is has nine districts in it. Uh, the nine districts are based on like different cultures and stuff like that. Like there's uh, the winter uh, Fae have their own uh, realm in it. Um, the, which is the uh, uh, wow. My brain just went right out the window. Uh, winter bank, winter bank district. Uh, you have Don Rowe, which is the Summer Fay. So in the Summer Fay and the Winter Fay have a war going on between each other. Um, and then you have the High Rise Central area, which is basically where all the skyscrapers are and where all the businesses do their business. Mm -hmm. um, and behind that, behind its shadow, is Wolf Water. And Wolf Water is the slums of the of the city. Um you have Obsidian, which is the vampire district, so it's kind of the rich and fancy type people. Uh, you have Marble Rock Pier, which is like the workers and the middle class type area. Uh, you have Littleton, which is basically a small little chunk of Grimwood that the gnomes have dug out for themselves. Uh, and then you have the Iron Chapel, which is basically where the Silver Flame has taken his control. Silver Flame is a god in the world, and he's created a human base area that um, he uses to his own will. 
And the last one is Silk Way. Silk Way is up in the northern part of Grimwood. It's far away from everything, and basically the were spiders control that area. Were spiders. Um, yes, were spiders. So the setting has were creatures in it, um, vampires, um, fae, um, a new race called archlings, which are half angels. Oh, cool. And then um, it uh, includes gnomes, though gnomes are not a playable character, but they do exist. Um, and goblins are listed under Fey, so there's a lot of goblins references too, but they are Fey. Um, uh, yeah, so that those are basically the playable races currently are um, Ironbound, which are your humans. Um, you have your Archlings, which are your half angels. Uh, you have emo varian vampires which are your emotional vampires they tend to they drain emotional energy from people oh my um, ex-wife okay. <laughs> okay uh the corafons vampires which are vampires that are your typical movie vampires they drink blood um your fey your ironbound which are your straight humans your unseen which are your humans who know about magic and can actually use it and then your were creatures and under were creatures, the playable were creatures are wolf, tiger, bear, and lion. Um, and the were creatures in my world aren't a disease; they were born that way, and they ha only have two forms: human and hybrid form. So they can't just be a spider. Correct. Okay. Okay. That's cool. So, uh, let me let me ask you this: how um, how deeply could you go into this with homebrew? Oh, the, you could homebrew this just as easy as easy D six. So I could uh, potentially just create a city and stick what I wanted in it. Absolutely. You could create your own races and stuff like that, too. Uh, in fact, my second book after this book is finished is going to be a uh, animal animal based uh, superhero game. So you're going to have animal uh, animomorphic animals and superheroes mixed together. That's going to be my second game. Same system, same system, doing it with the exact same system. Cool. Minor changes, but pretty yeah, yeah. much the same system. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I mean, you got to tailor it for the setting, but uh, that was the thing I loved about um, Savage Worlds when I first got it. Right there near the front of the book, setting rules. You know, you can put, plug these in, take them out, create your own. And I did, uh, you know, for your the I, setting you're in. I was going to go with a system agnostics, uh, <laughs> agnostic system, and I just found it so hard to write that I just decided, well, I'll write a setting, and then the setting will dictate my rules, and that actually helped quite a bit. I get that. Um, even the implied setting that's in, uh, like, uh, uh, Shadow Dark, I get right. it, because it made it easy for her to write how the spells, not how the spells work, but what the spells are, what they affect. Because if you if you assumed right off the bat that I could be playing on a planet or I could be playing on a starship, it's going to make it very difficult to write some of those rules because her, her, her motto is keep it short. Right. You know, and the spells are like two paragraphs, maybe. And a paragraph's two sentences. But if you had to explain that for for um, Spelljammer and uh, Dark Sun and uh, uh, Greyhawk, all three of them are the implied world, that would start getting difficult. I will say that all of my feats are less than three sentences long. Good. Which I was pretty happy about. 
Very good. Um, and, uh, uh... Okay. Wait, what? Go ahead. What were we going to ask? Oh, I was looking at the, what uh, Herman wrote here. Oh, emo, emo vents. Yeah. Uh, Colin, what we do in the shadows. Yes, exactly. Colin, as in what we do in the shadows. Yes, that he would be an emo variant vampire in my world. Okay. I will take your word for that. I have never seen... Uh... You sh- if you haven't, what we do in the shadows is very funny. It's a bunch of vampires who live together, and it's hilarious. I, I've been meaning to give it a look. Um, I, I really enjoyed being human. If you've ever, if you've ever seen that, mm-hmm. uh, I didn't see the British version. I saw the I saw the U.S. version, and I really liked that. So this kind of has an appeal. I'm, I have this thing though about about fantasy and horror genres and when you suddenly start seeing comedies about them you know that the 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 genres taken a dive we got a bunch of comedy vampire movies in the uh 80s early oh, late 70s early 80s very and, well done okay uh i mean it's a documentary so you gotta keep that in mind when you watch it got it it's like a fake documentary okay so. All right. Um, but it's very good. Uh, All right. So yeah. now you just did a uh, um, a version of your setting for Easy D6, correct? I did. And that is out on Drive Through RPG. Yep. Right. So uh, yeah, it's called Grimwood City. So for those of you who are interested, um it it looks really good and i need to i need to go get it uh speaking of that uh room jammer is happening at the end of the month and i have three games of the easy d6 version at room jammer oh cool so, um so if you guys want to play an easy d6 version of the setting i got uh three games going on room jammer and there's still got a lot of space up there Yes, and Rune Jammer, Rune, Rune, Rune Jammer is uh, Rune Hammer's. Um, it's it's like a a virtual con. Is that correct? It is. It's a virtual con, hundred percent free. You can go to RuneJammer.com and sign up, and there's a whole bunch of games going on. Right, and uh, Rune Hammer is the company that publishes Easy D Six. Yep, didn't write it. Nope, published it. Yeah, that was DM Scott. He wrote it, but uh, uh, and uh, um, I um, index card IP. Uh, I, I cannot speak. Index card RPG uh, is another one of their games, and the newest one is uh, Crown Crown and Skull. Crown Crown and Skull. I keep wanting to say Thorn. Crown and Skull. There's too many something and somethings out there. I get them. I start getting them mixed up. Uh, and Game Master Vault, there is no sparkly vampires in my game. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> None whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Crown of Skull is very good. I have just finished reading it, and I can't wait to try uh, my hand at it. It looks amazing. Um I, I don't know on it. if I'll like it because I like rolling dice and the GM doesn't roll dice on it, but yeah. we'll try. I'll still try it. Yeah, that's that's a thing that, that kind of puts me off about a couple games out there that I've wanted to to um, get a little closer to, but oh, I'm not going to ever roll any dice. Okay. I just like rolling dice. I am a dice goblin, so it's it's. I mean, Herman and I were in a band together, and yeah, I played drums. And uh, there have been a couple times since then when I had to stand up on a stage behind a microphone and just sing something. I have no idea, idea what to do with my hands, and I have the feeling that if I don't 
have any dice to roll, that's what's going to happen to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's kind of intimidating, I have to admit. Uh, I definitely made sure in my system we roll dice because I like rolling dice. I do too. Um, and I certainly so, have enough of them. So there's uh, seven, uh, eight, nine classes also that will be in the starting classes. Uh -huh. uh, you'll have assassins. Uh, you have hackers, holy warriors, which are basically your holy knights. Uh, mediums, um, monster hunters, priest, soldiers, and thief, and then last but not least, wizards. Okay. And uh, they all have unique abilities and things like that. Ironically, the one that you think is the weapon master, the soldier, is not the weapon master. Uh, he commands a lot of the playing field and can command people to go places and give them bonuses for doing so. Um, where your monster hunter is more of your your fighter class, your berserker type character class. Um, he said there was a priest, Herman. Yeah, there is a priest. Yeah. No clerics, just a priest. Yeah. I mean, that's what that's what the clerics are called in... in uh... Shadow Dark priests. So um there's a game. Is it is it I don't think it's 5e. I could be wrong. I don't play 5e enough to know. But uh there's a game that has a a like a guy, a, a, there's a character class that does that. It 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 when they're in, in a battle, they like give bonuses to everybody else because they're like commanding the. Mm, there the was battlefield. in, in three point five. There was something that you could do. You could get a subclass for the fighter that could do that. Hello, K nine. How are you, K nine? Outstanding. How are you doing? Um, yeah, maybe it's yeah the Cavalier. Yeah, yep, that was the name. Maybe they have something like that in Pathfinder now. I don't know. I, probably. I mean, Pathfinder has a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, I can't. I can't remember. It, Cavalier could be it. it. It doesn't sound right, but like I said, I'm not familiar enough with with all the minutia of D and D to uh, really. Hey, know what... Dan's in the in the house. Hey, Dan. Hey. Welcome. I got a bunch of people here. Outstanding. Ah, okay. Well, let's see here. I had notes and I appear to have covered them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, n n for the people who want to uh, go ahead and multi class, there is a feat that they can take called Jack of All Trades, which allows you to take another uh, feat from another. Uh, class because there are class specific feats um, and then on top of that there's also would be wizard which allows you to add kind of a wizard um, ability to any other class which is kind of cool huh okay I like that yeah it's you 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 lose a feat but you gain some uh, some benefits from 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 it for other things. Um, in fact, one of the pre-gen characters that's going to come with the game uh, is a assassin, would-be wizard, who has shadow element casting, so he can do things like create darkness and that type of thing. Right. To help with assassinations. So, Kassad Jake says Pathfinder has the martial dedication, which does a lot of things along those lines. That may be what I'm thinking of. Yeah, Jake. Jake has uh does Pathfinder quite a bit, so right. Um, yeah. Oh, and I, I I missed that. Uh, yeah, Mike up here said it. It's Pathfinder. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. Oh, we got a got a full house tonight. Um. So, how did you come up with the the mechanic that you're using? 
what was your thought process behind it? I liked EZD6. I liked Cypher System. And I liked Savage Worlds. So I wanted something that kind of combined all of them. Um, and that's how I kind of started my mechanical decision. And then it just kind of changed from there. Um, I mean, I have the feet system, the feet and the flaw system that's very similar to Savage Worlds. Um, and then I have um, the pool system, which was really kind of helping um, the uh, cipher system. And then I have the rolling mechanic, which is very similar to Easy D6. So, like, I've changed them a little, uh, but sure. that's where their inspiration definitely came from. The reason I'm asking is, uh, well, I, I, I've developed a new one recently, and it's not an actual combat system or how the game works, but I'll, I'll get into it in a few minutes here. But about a year and a half ago, live, we worked on a new system here. And I developed it, and it works. And I hate it. <laughs> it's pure garbage. Works exactly the way it was supposed to. And I would never play this. You uh, couldn't pay me to play this game. It took lots of playtesting. I have probably over 300 hours of playtesting in this game already. I did not have that much testing for this. I, I will admit there's about 45 minutes, and that's all it took for me to declare that this is garbage. I don't want to develop it further. No way, no how. We're done. Um, I took a cue from Savage Worlds, and I tweaked it a little. And so your, your, your dice that you roll for a task is always going to be three dice and they scale so you can have a d4 you can have three d4s in this this stat or you can have a d4 and two d6s or a d4 a d6 and a d8 but you can never get more than one uh step away from each other so you couldn't have a d4 and a d8 and a d10 and it was great, and I figured it out, and it worked, and combat worked, and the magic worked, and everything worked, and it was so fiddly that I just said, nope, I'm going to file this away, and I will never use it again. And I started with having exploding dice, because I really like the exploding dice from Savage Worlds, and I quickly cut that out. It made the math way too hard to figure out. It can really get out of hand in a hurry. <laughs> uh, uh, I was losing a lot of what Easy D6 does well, what DM Scotty does well, and I wanted to keep some of that feel. Yeah. Um, it was getting too complicated at that point. Yeah. I'm, uh, I, look, I, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that someone is... Um, erring on the side of easy versus hard. I wanted complication, but I didn't want it hard. Right. I like having, I like, I'm a min-maxer at heart, which I know is a faux pas in the, in the world of TTRPG, but for me, I like min-maxing. I like having, I like my hair characters to be a hero in the story. I get that. And uh, so I was missing, I really enjoyed Easy D6, but I was missing that min-maxing capability that I like. Right. Um, so adding the feats into it and adding the pool system into it gives me that feel of being able to min-max my character. But it also gives me the ability to make a character that's not min max that has this really outrageous story that goes along with their stats. So, um. well, uh, having played with a a dedicated min maxer for decades, uh, 
I'm quite familiar um, with how min maxing can get out of hand, but you know, to a certain extent, you're gonna you're gonna maximize the strengths of your character anyway. Um, I'm yeah. very I'm very big about if I'm going to min max, I need to have a story reason for the min maxing. Like, if I'm going to make a barbarian that's super strong and super stupid, there's got to be a story driven reason for that. Right. So, um, I do do that. But uh, what I like about my system is it, it allows for you to do that min maxing because you can make a character in six steps. That for me is one of the most attractive parts of your game uh it literally you you all your pools start at two you have six points that you can spread through those pools and i usually recommend people wait until they choose their class and their race you choose a class you choose a race you choose your feats and an optional step is you choose your flaws and then you add feats based on how uh the flaws that you take um, that's as simple as it, it, it doesn't get any more complicated than that. The only reason why character creation takes forever is player freeze because there's so many choices. Ah, yeah, I was a, I was a, um, graphics designer for years and I learned right away. Um, don't, don't give them 10 choices, give them three. And not only that, give them one choice that you really like that they ought to take and then give them two other choices that are okay. Steer them where they need to go. But when I'm sitting down to create a character, I'm always looking for the thing that nobody else did. So, yeah, I want choices. So it, it's a contradictory thing in my head, but but... I get that. Um, As a player that doesn't do a lot of bards or character skilled characters, I had trouble developing those type of skills. But luckily, I had a lot of playtesters that enjoyed that. So I was able to get quite a few of those feats in here that really help and hone that type of player. So, one moment. Sure. There we go. Yes, Herman. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, but I mean, look, he, he's always played that way, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I, I know. When Mike sits down at my table, I know, and and not uh, not the Mike who's here. Um, when Mike sits down at my table, that's what I'm going to get. He will min max the hell out of it, and uh, and that's okay. Uh, I, don't ever play D and D with me because I min max D and D like wicked. Yeah, he he managed to min max. Um, uh, a mage character in my Mage the Ascension game. And um, I I feel that some of his frustration with the game has always been that the character was so limited in what he could do. He could do what he could do really, really well. But everybody around him is doing a bunch of things and he couldn't. And I think that was... a a added a level of frustration for him. Uh, I also I personally think. play a lot of combat oriented characters because that's I do too. what I enjoy. So I do too. I was playing a character in, in Herman's um, Savage Worlds game, however, who had no combat skills at all. Uh, I created a, 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 this was a modern game but I created a half-elf hacker. Mm. And she just sat behind a computer and 
tapped away. That is a very much capable character that you can make in my game. Uh, a hacker that just sits behind a computer and helps from afar. Yeah. Well, see, what I really wanted, though, was for her to be forced out of that and have to go into the field and that, not have any not have any ability to protect herself that was that was part of what i was really aiming for we didn't get to continue with that but uh yeah cuz for me that's 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 where i'm going to get the best role playing and my tendency is to really just just like go in with a guy who can pound the hell out of everything right that's my tendency too although but i try I, not to but i know on the front side while i'm creating the character well if i do that i'm going to play him the way i've played every other character who could do that so if i just design somebody who doesn't do that and can't as a fallback position can't just pick up a sword and beat the hell out of somebody then i'm going to be forced to go in different directions i've and recently found myself playing a lot of wizards which i used to be just a straight martial type player so um and i'm finding that i'm stretching a little bit by doing so um and that was my issue with pathfinder 1e gave me a bad taste on min max but loving 2e and gotten a healthier view understanding of it that's interesting because we've got a a um a 1e cheerleader here in game master's vault and now we have a 2e cheerleader down here so yeah outstanding that's all right I'm the, the, really the great... excited for dc20 i think dc20 looks good it looks really good um the the thing that i like about uh, this golden age of RPGs we're living through right now is that there is a game for everybody. If, there if is. you like, I don't know. Uh, I mean, look at Monster Hearts. I mean, that's a good example of something that's really out there that only a few people enjoy. I it's have a great system. Uh, it's basically Buffy the Vampire Slayer without any, like, vampire slaying. It's just the interactions with the uh, teenage monsters. Interesting. Yeah, it's really cool. Okay. It's only like two pages long, too. It's it's a really cool system. Nice. I was gonna, I was gonna bring this up earlier, so I might as well do it now. Uh, we were talking about systems, and this is the latest one that I have come up with. So this is an add-on to my Shadow Dark game. Uh, not the one I'm running currently, but next year I'm running a new campaign called Red Giant. And I want something in it that doesn't feel like anything I've run before. So for those of you who play Shadow Dark uh, or don't, uh, there's a luck mechanic in the game. You get a chip or whatever, and you can use it to reroll anything. And then if you do something clever in the game later, you can get another one. So what I'm going to be doing is uh, I have these dice. They are D16s. And uh, because that is not used in the game. Um, they are really messed up. can't read most of the numbers but the one is there and the 16 is there if you use a luck token um, we're gonna throw one of these in the pool and somebody else uses another one we throw it in the pool if anybody um, crit fails on a spell whatever's in the pool and there's only 10 so 10 is the maximum whatever's in the pool we're gonna roll and if we roll 
anything but a one or a 16, well, then it doesn't do anything. But if a one comes up or a 16 comes up, we need to see how many more of the ones there are than the 16s because the ones are going to be failure, crit fail, and the 16 is going to be success. Does this make okay. sense so far? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so if they've already crit failed and we roll three ones and nothing else or three ones and a 16, whatever, um, then the crit fail is going to be just spectacular. Actually, um, I like that mechanic quite a bit. Yeah, and if it's if we roll some more 16s, then we get ones. Well, instead of a crit fail, it's going to succeed. But something horrible is going to happen as well. Hmm. It's called the chaos pool. It's a neat concept. Yeah, I, I, I wanted something that's different. And I wanted something that was mechanical and not, oh, well, they did this too many times. You need to, you know, bump up the, the damage or something. And, you know, just... just invent something on the fly so um, just don't just don't play with wes he'll he'll crit fail on all the time and it'll, <laughs> it won't build up i've heard that <laughs> i have heard that <laughs> uh yeah wes from dm tales rolls really poorly <sighs> well unless he has to roll low then he rolls really well <laughs> Ah, uh, well, um, we had a, we had a bunch of, uh, ones rolled the last time we played Shadow Dark. Uh, the wizard kept rolling ones, um, not, not on spells. You know, I don't think he ever did it when he was casting a spell, but he did it on a bunch of other stuff. Like, like, okay, no one's, no one's bothering to look for this thing. Let me give him a dice roll to see if they notice it. The wizard isn't sure he's on the planet <laughs> because he's rolled three ones in a row. Uh, but the dumb guy over here with the sword, he's getting everything. It, it's it's just funny. Uh, count on Will Wheaton, too. Dude would roll fine until the pool was at the max and then roll ten ones. Yeah. <laughs> uh I've seen I've seen uh, um, like highlight reel stuff with him screwing up like that. Yes, I think that's why uh, West likes easy d six. He can modify his rolls with karma. There you go. Oh, now we're gonna have a conflict. Oh dear, needs to play more two d twenty games like Star Trek game. Oh, oh. I despise that system so much. <laughs> uh, it wants it wants to be Savage Worlds so bad. And I've just, never seen it. It just isn't. Uh, Star Trek, uh, Conan. Um, okay, I've seen Conan, but I haven't played it. Yeah, there's there's some more. Uh, um, 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 you know the one that oh, Fallout. Yeah, the new Fallout. Uh, and um, son of a bitch, this is the one that I played and hated. Uh, uh, Octone Cthulhu. Oh, Octone Cthulhu is D twenty. Yeah, two D twenty. Yes, it is. Uh, Octung Cthulhu is is Cthulhu in World War II. I so the Nazis, Nazis, I are like trying to get mythos stuff to win the war. I like the D one hundred Cthulhu, so I probably just stick with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the first edition of Octung Cthulhu used the sixth edition Call of Cthulhu rules. Oh, okay. Or the Savage Worlds rules. Um, although there's so many mistakes in that that it's almost unusable if you needed to read it. Oh, so Savage Worlds. Uh, what is it if you don't like? So Savage Worlds uses um, dice as their stats. 
So if you have, oh um, yeah, uh, if you have like you have like a D six in like agility or D D twelve in charisma. I don't remember what the stats are, and I've played it for years. You think I would know them, but I don't. Um, but basically, you get one D D four through D twelve capabilities and you get to roll those and if you get max you get to roll it again and if you get max you get to roll it again it has an exploding dice system it's actually really fun yeah but um yeah the so the 2d20 system um the thing that is uh so much like savage worlds is the momentum i think that's what they call it uh the way the chips work uh, there's a lot of that going on in Savage Worlds, and it was it was very noticeable when I got the the playtest rules for Octoon Cthulhu that the language looked just like felt just like the language from the Savage Worlds rules and the, how they use uh, uh, bennies. It's the same thing. You can re-roll stuff, right? I I have a Destiny die in my game that's very similar to the bennies. Yeah. So they uh, they they tacked that on to a really unwieldy dice system that I just can't handle. But the thing that really turned me off more than that was when I got the playtest rules and they were asking for feedback. And uh, we had gotten an update because the, the first set of uh, stuff we got, you couldn't create an entire character from it. Like, not you couldn't create a playable character. They gave us a scenario to play, but there wasn't enough there to create a character. So we got an update about two or three weeks later, and it started referring to page numbers that they didn't send us. Um. And then there was another update that started referring to rules that were not in the play test materials, except two of them were. They had changed the names, but they didn't change them in the page with in the, the, the section where the rules were. They changed them in the section that told you how to create the character. So it took us like three hours to figure out that, oh, this rule is that rule. We didn't know that. As somebody who has changed things consistently, it's very difficult to keep track of where you place things. I, I understand that. <laughs> but if they don't send me all of the material, but they're insisting that they get an update. That's true. I'll give you that. Well, no. No. And I had, we had four people plowing through this crap. And after the third Saturday afternoon that we wasted um, I said anybody going to object if I just throw all this in the trash nope and I just emptied the binder and walked over and put it in the trash can that was the last time we looked at it I will never play this game I still need to get somebody to play my game as a DM only person who has never DM'd my game is me and that's a problem I have a similar problem. I have been running uh, World of Darkness games since 1995, and I have never once just played it. I've been a GM for 29 years and never played the game as a player. <laughs> uh, I, I've done very similar things with other games, but not that long but yeah um there are games where i've never played as a player that i wanted to play as a player so i oh. hope so because i would like to get somebody to play it even if it's not on stream dan just somebody to actually sit down and do a one shot with it or something yeah just to see what happens because uh, I don't know how it reads as a DM because <laughs> I have not had it. I've had players read it and they understand it, 
but as a DM, do you understand how I'm creating all the monsters and that type of stuff is something that I am going to work on. And hopefully with the backer kit, if you back it and I get enough funding, I can actually pay some DMs to actually play it and give me feedback on it because a lot of DMs want to be paid now, which I find hilarious because I would do, I would DM a game just for free, just because. I, I have been paid to run a game one time, and that was in 1983. But that's it. I got paid pretty well to run it. I mean, if you don't count my Twitch Twitch funding that I get, I've never been played paid to play yeah, a game. Me either. Um, I mean, so. except that one time. So, but let's talk about the backer kit. So, sure. Um, when does that go live? Uh, backer kit goes live September 1st. You can go to the teaser page from Grimwood Grimwood uh, dot games slash backer kit um, and uh, sign up for uh, the uh, to be notified when it does go live. <laughs> um, you were only three. I'm sorry. Might have been a little might have been a little uh, over your head at that point. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so it does go live in September. It's going live for uh, 30 days. So it'll be, well, 31 days. It will be done on September 31st. So in October, I'm hoping to get out a uh, play, uh, a updated play test for people who back it. So um, that way you can kind of play an October Halloween game with it because it, kind of lends itself to the horror genre because just because of its nature you are uh, uh you're you're preaching to the choir here <laughs> um i do not do horror well but it does have that action adventure horror feel so um but uh so uh, the backer kit's gonna have um so it's done by it's going to be printed by uh, drive through um, okay. RPG. Even though I didn't want to do that, it kind of is a situation where I kind of have to for my first game. I Will think. this be hardcover or? Uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be released on drive through hardcover, soft cover, and premium hardcover. Okay. Um, the pledge levels are going to be fifteen dollars for just the PDF version, um, and then there's a twenty-five dollar version, which is going to have the book option um, from a drive-through. So you you buy buy it from drive-through at cost, and then um, pay shipping through drive-through. Uh, there's going to be a city councilman. Uh, level which allows you to actually create a NPC that's going to be in the book uh, a savior of the city um, level which will you'll be able to create a place in the city and um, a NPC and then the destroyer of the city which allows you to create a monster that will show up in the book um, the city councilman is going to be 35, savior of the city is going to be 55, and the destroyer of the city will be 75. Um, and those are going to be the pledge levels for it. I'm very interested. Um, yeah. I'm very interested. Uh, so... September 1st, um, I'm, I'm going to go and make sure I get notified. So, uh, and East Gillum, uh, the only reason why I'm very hesitant about drive through is I'm not 100% impressed with my Grimwood City for Easy D6. It looks okay, but the print quality is kind of flat. Yeah, I get that. Um, uh, I've had no problems with them shipping things incorrectly or anything like that. It's just a matter of their print quality is not as good as some other places. Um, 
my main problem with with uh, drive through is the uh, one of the first books I got from them was my 20th anniversary Mage the Ascension. And that's a boat anchor. And it took about three days for the actual book to start separating from the spine. Ooh, that's not good. No, it's not at all. So through a combination of um, some glue and uh, literal like packing tape, I got it put back together. And it's usable, but I hate that I will probably never have uh, one of the premium copies from the the original um, Kickstarter on that because right. I didn't know about it at the time. Uh, we were running another game and I just wasn't paying attention. So, but yeah, so uh, that's that's what the Kickstarter. That's yeah. what the backer kit's going to be. It's it's yeah, um, pretty simple. Uh, mainly, I'm just doing extra tiers for putting input into the game, which is cool. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, print on demand thing, more than just a drive through thing. Yeah, yeah I it get is that. more of a print on demand, th demand that, thing. That, that's how you get your books from drive through so yeah uh, um, if they if they had a thing where you know there there's an offset printer actually printed the books and and they were stitch bound and they could just ship you stuff if they had a warehouse but they don't have a warehouse um that isn't their business model right i i'd pay the extra to get it because uh, well, I, I found a couple printers, and to get 750 copies, it was going to cost me almost $8,000. Yeah. And then I still have to find a distribution system and all that. So I just decided to go print on demand. Right. I, I get it. I, I just got my uh, Tome of Adventure design uh, a couple weeks ago, and this thing is it's a beast. Um, it weighs as much as the 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 Mage the Ascension book I was talking about. It's half the size because uh, the paper is really nice. It's stitch bound, and the 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 cover is not going to fall apart. And mm. I I know exactly who I would want to go through for printing uh, if I did get enough to do printing, um, but. I'm going to go drive through this time, and then next time maybe I'll have a higher income stream for it. <clears throat> yep. So no, I don't blame you one bit. And, it is going well, to be eight and a half by eleven, though, so it's going to be a full size book. Okay. Um, I mean, down the road, uh, you I know, could always do a special edition. Yep. Right. Come back and reprint it, and you know, correct any mistakes you find or. Inevitably, oh, I'm sure that players are going to find. Uh, in inevitably, uh, uh, it's going to be about 130 pages, probably ooh. a little bit more with uh, if people did do the extra backer stuff. Um, there are vehicles in there also, um, so you're going to have some vehicle mechanics in there, um, which I'm excited about. Uh, so yeah I've got a question here what is your favorite system that is not your own or easy d6 and I'll answer after you do but um man that's a tough one <laughs> um I probably have to say the cipher system even though I've only played in it I haven't dm'd it um or okay no actually let me rephrase that dragon bane dragon bane is one of my favorite systems okay still have not played uh 
a free league game. So uh, looking forward to trying one of those. I actually borrowed heavily from for my initiative from Dragon Bay because I really like the initiative in Dragon Bay. How do they do it? Uh, they do it with a card system of one through ten, and you do it, you every round you re reshuffle the cards and hand them back out. I do it in my system with a standard deck of cards. You just take a suit out, and then you go from ace all the way up to king. Okay. And I do it highest, uh, low, uh, lowest card goes first. So ace all the way up. So. Cool. Yeah, Savage Worlds does a, a card-based initiative. It doesn't work that way, but yeah. Um, and I really like that. Um, I got a couple. I got, I, got, I got more than one answer to that question. My, my favorite top of the heap though is definitely world of darkness so the storyteller system i mean it's it's in my name here so uh definitely that but um i really like savage worlds i've run a whole lot of it since 2019 when i first discovered it and i really uh Really am enjoying uh, Shadow Dark, which, if you're not familiar, is is basically 5e with all the junk tossed out. So it's 5e for the OSR crowd. I definitely still want to play that. I, ha- I I want to get a copy. I haven't got my copy of it yet. So good. Um, basically, the only part of it that's 5e is the way you roll the dice. So D20, roll high, um, advantage, disadvantage. I don't know. Is there anything else that may be it? Um, uh, it's not definitely on my list of games to play in 2020 at, by the end of 2024. Initiative is rolled the same way, but then you roll initiative at the beginning of the game and... Whoever wins, that's where we're starting, and we're just going to go clockwise around the table. And everything works in initiative order. So, okay, well, we're leaving town. All right, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And they get to the DM, and well, here's what has happened. If, if anything, if you even notice anything, and then what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Get back then when it gets to the fight. Well, whoever we were on, that's who's going to start. And... Yeah. Uh, nice. Now, now, occasionally, um, you will just to mix things up. It's like, let's roll initiative again. See where I, we're going to start. We're going to go very, in the other direction now. <laughs> I very much made sure that my game had initiative every round because I hate rolling a really bad initiative and being stuck in it for 20 minutes while combat is happening. I have. I have gotten to the point now where I don't care where I am in the initiative order. After 43 years, I don't care. Um, if, if we're rolling every round, I care. Okay, so that makes me care. But if we're, if we're, we're going to roll once, okay, I'm, I'm fifth. That's fine. I mean, it might as well be first. It doesn't make any difference. When that guy finishes, I'm going, and then these people are going after me. So, so effectively, the guy who's rolling first is going after me. I found by rolling every, doing it every initiative, I, my players paid attention more. I get that, um, and and I agree, and I I do pay attention more. Herman um, runs his. Um, old school essentials game and uh we we roll for uh side initiative so either the dm's going first or the players are going first and we don't really pay attention to what order the players are going in and all the monsters go on the dm's turn right my game too right so um it suddenly makes a difference because if we 
lose initiative once, and I, I kind of like this, if we lose initiative once and I cast a, a lightning bolt and I have another lightning bolt ready and we win initiative the next time, well, I got to hit this guy twice before he could do anything. I like that. Because if you just roll initiative once, well, then I'm going to go and then he's going to go and then I'm going to go and then he's going to go. So that becomes an issue sometimes. But I... When, okay, so in my World of Darkness game, we roll initiative, and I just write it down, and that's that's where we're staying. Uh, is the OSE and OSR stuff fun, East Gollum says? Oh, God, yes. Yes, it's, very much so. It's, uh, I think it has to do with, the ga- is the game fun? Not necessarily OSR or, or OSE. Like, I think there are some OSR games that are really bad. Um, it's just a matter of getting... Yeah. It's just a matter of which game you're playing. Yeah, so OSE is Old School Essentials, and that's one of the original OSR games. Yeah. And so Herman is running that. Uh, our friend Mike runs um, Swords and Wizardry, which is basically a white box clone. Mm-hmm. And um, it cleaned up considerably. And the same guy who wrote it, who wrote that book I was holding up earlier, uh, Matt Finch. Um, I have the new version uh, signed because uh, he was at North Texas. Nice. Last month. He's always at North Texas. Um, he lives in Houston. So, uh yeah, Swords and Wizardry is a is a great system. It's one little book. Um, Old School Essentials is a a like a a bunch of little of small books, like digest size, and they're really cool. And then then uh, Shadow Dark is a thick book that's digest size, and it's kind of a blend of 5e and all of the old stuff but her main inspiration was ose and 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 swords and wizardry she talked to matt finch a lot while she was developing this and uh i think it's just a matter of which game you're playing is the game good and and there's there's dozens of them so you just got to find the one you want if you want to play uh, an OSR game that's really risque and um, uh, you know really pushes the envelope in that direction, then Lamentations of the Flame Princess. I mean, then you have stuff like DCC, which is very Gonzo and Gonzo and yeah, yeah. uses a dice chain, which is really yep. interesting. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of different. Games. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, Joe Block is um, working on a new version of Adventures Dark and Deep, which is AD and D first edition rewritten. Well, it's AD and D second edition, uh, but not based on second edition. It's based on first edition. Uh, Joe Block knew Gary Gygax, and this is a lot of the things that Gary talked about doing and wanted to do with second edition before he got kicked out of TSR. So the first edition of Adventures Dark and Deep is basically how Gary would have done second edition. And now there's going to be a second edition of this game, which is going to push it a little further, but the game has to evolve. So. Yep. Games have to evolve it or it's just not fun. Right. Yes, Herman played Lamentations of the Flame Princess at North Texas last month. Nice. Uh, I've never gotten to play that one. Um, You played a lot of games, and you weren't even signed up for any. (laughs) That you got into a lot of cool games, buddy, and ran a really good one. So, thumbs up. Um. Well, let's see here. What what uh, what have we not covered? I think we've covered everything. I'm very interested in in uh, in this game. I'm I'm 
I'm planning to back it. Uh, well, I and, appreciate that. And I, I really think after you said that, that I, I kind of want to put a location in the game. How much was that level? Uh, that level was Savior of the City, which is 55. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. I can I can do that. I want to put a place in there and I know exactly what place it's going to be. Cuz it's 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 uh Oh yeah, Morkborg. Morkborg, I I Pirate Borg is so much fun. I I have it played. I want to. Uh the only problem I have with Pirate Borg is it's not really good for a campaign. It's good for one shots and you could do a campaign with it, but I had a lot of problems with doing a campaign with it. It was really good as a one shot, though. The I, I saw a video. The guys who wrote it, I think this was on um, Gaiku Games. I don't know if you ever watched that YouTube channel, but uh, highly recommended. He does lots of interviews with indie game creators. Um. It's it's uh, G E I K U Games, I believe is how it's spelled. Gaiku Games. Uh, he's Canadian. It sounds like he ought to be Asian, but he he isn't. <laughs> he he lives in Calgary. Um, but the guys, the one of the guys who created it said, um, uh, ideally, what you would do is you play the whole. You play all the way through this this game until the world ends in the game. The literal world comes to an end, and then you take your book down to the ocean, set it on fire, and and send it out to sea to die. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I don't think I want to burn my book, though. That's kind of like how Mutant Year Zero works in free, from Free, free League. They. Uh, you're the world's gonna die in two weeks yeah you have two weeks to live enjoy them and do what you need to <laughs> you don't have a choice the world is going to end you cannot save it it is going yeah. to end in two weeks yeah um so dcc is about as gonzo as you can get and still be um D D. Um, it's kind of based off of, uh, fourth edition, third edition, fourth edition, somewhere in there. And, um, really, uh, the dice chain is what sets it apart from everything else. You've got D3 and D4, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, you know, the, the, the weird dice are there. Um, that's, that's how I ended up with these, uh. These yeah, they have teams. really interesting dice. And instead of having advantage, disadvantage, so you roll two D20s and take the higher, or you, or you take the lower, you'll move up and down on the dice chain. So you're trying to do something. Uh, well, roll a D24 for that instead of the D20. So you got a better chance of doing it. And that's kind of cool. Uh, I I have played Mutant Crawl Classics in a in a zero level uh uh, uh not gauntlet what do they call it um funnel a funnel funnel yeah and the guy who ran it he's one of the guys who runs uh, Long Con out in uh, East Texas but he put a stack of characters about this tall on the table and he said. When your character dies, just grab another one and keep going. It was like, okay. <laughs> and I did, I went through seven characters. I did a Pathfinder 2E funnel with Avenue Studios at Excelicon. I can't say that. Wes is going to get me. Um, anyways, I did that and I went through 14 characters. Ecclesicon? Ecclesicon, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Avenue Studios is heading out. Yeah. 
Uh, e uh, I want to write an alternate play kit for Easy D6. How would you recommend approaching that? Write the setting first. Um, because Easy D6 will just fit into most settings. Yeah. Uh, I would write, I would, I would approach it. How I approached Grimwood, I, I approached it from writing the setting and building the setting. And then I attached Easy D6 to that, that setting because it's not hard to do. Easy D6 is pretty simple. If you've got the setting um, written, changing, tweaking, adding a rule to Easy D6 to make it fit the, the setting uh, might be a matter of one page of text. Yeah, it's the setting. My Easy D6 book is mostly, I think, literally, uh, if you don't count characters and stuff, it's like 12 pages of actual rules. Yeah. And the Maybe. rest is just settings. Just setting books. And it's it, my, it's uh, 103 pages long, so... Yeah, it's uh, it's such an easy system to write for. Um, just just come up with the scenario because figuring out how easy D six fits into the scenario will be a lot easier than trying to figure out, like we were talking about earlier, how to write something for anybody's setting. Figure out your setting, then stick the rules in it, and it'll it'll almost write itself for you. Easy D6 is, I mean, it's, it's right there on the cover. It's easy. And if you have problems, you scale them after you have a setting, hit me up. I've got a lot of cool tricks that I figured out with the Easy D6. There you go. Um, you know how to get a hold of me. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, Easy D6 is so easy to write for. Yeah. I, I sat down, I had the book for three weeks, and I thought, you know, I need to run something with this. And it took me about two nights here on the stream, and I had a had a scenario ready. So, um, and I have one of the, well, video on demand, that's way out of date, but it's on my YouTube channel. I ran one. Uh, game and then uh, we recorded it and I played it here but uh, yeah and of course it was a horror setting because that's just what I do that's just what you do yeah <laughs> even if it's even if, I, my shadow dark game is a horror game um yeah I, I well we're, we're we, we found some soldiers camped in a field yeah okay <laughs> good luck with that well there's not any horror here uh-huh sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah just wait I have, a, I have a buddy who plays in my game um, his name is Sean and doesn't matter what we're playing at some point during the, during the game he's going to go ah there it is <laughs> okay alright yeah yeah thought we were playing nice but all of a sudden there it is okay I got it <laughs> uh he says, how, you, you're, how do you sleep at night? When you go to bed, it just, I mean, it just must be screams for eight hours. No, I, I sleep great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, East Gillum, if you want, I can send you the updated rules, too. I've updated and changed since I last sent them, sent them to you. Cool. Well... I am absolutely going to back your uh, your game. Well, I appreciate that. I really do. I am in. Uh, I don't think I have a Kickstarter in me. Um, because most of the games I write for uh, don't really lend themselves well to that. You know, you got to jump through too many hoops to, to do something. I mean, Savage Worlds is okay, but uh, World of Darkness is kind of complicated. 
So, and that's, I mean, 90% of what I've ever written as a, as a GM is World of Darkness. I think, honestly, with you doing so many scenarios, I think oh. um, a Patreon would Your, be better for you. Hello? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, did I freeze? Dave, we have no volume on you. No volume. Where, why? There you are. There you are. Okay. Uh, I honestly, re watching you write all your stuff and stuff, I think you'd be better off with a Patreon that you can funnel all that stuff out. That's that. That's that's where I was headed. Yeah, I I think I'm gonna start a Patreon, and the patrons can just download what I've done. I mean, I've written. I think the last count was 147 adventures for my Metal God setting since 2017. So I got, I got, uh, you know. Thanks for stopping by, Ace Yes. Thank you very much. It's nice to meet you. So I think I could, uh, you know, upload an adventure a month and keep that going for quite some time and throw yeah. in some extras for Christmas or whatever, you know? I, I think you could too, seeing all your stuff. I appreciate it. I'm looking into it. Uh, time. <laughs> I I hear you on that. Like, I mean, I, I have 50 two three days till this i feel like i'm not prepared at all <laughs> yeah. and you're you're working a regular job too yeah see i'm retired but i've been trying to get the back of this house cleared out so we can get my mother moved in yeah and we finally got everything out of there i mean there's some stuff sitting there but it it's 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 got to go in the room next door i just have to move a couple of things but essentially it's done but I have to tear the carpet out and get a new floor put in. Uh, and uh, I, I, I may have told you this, I'm not sure, but um, we had a, we, we set up a schedule to get my brother moved in. And um, uh, if we're very diligent and we really keep at it, um, we're going to have her moved in here by the end of 2017. No problem. <laughs> that was the schedule that we set in 2012. 12 years later. Yeah, it was like the Soviet Union's five-year plan. It did not quite uh, pan out. So, still trying to get her in here. But... It's getting done finally. Good. But that takes up a lot of my time. All right. Well, um, I am going to. That's it. Get out of here and get a snack. Well, oh, thanks for having me on. I uh, thank you for being here. And uh, thank you guys uh, for, for showing up in chat. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. I think your game sounds amazing. I think the setting is going to impress my wife. She loves urban fantasy. So do I. But, you know, uh, I, I know if she's, if she's on board that it's going to be something pretty cool. So I'm cool. very interested to get her reaction. Thank you, Herman. Yeah, that was all, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate you being here. Uh, so, guys, we're just going to sign off, and uh, I will be back tomorrow night um, writing some more stuff. I have a I have a Metal Gods game coming up this Saturday, and I'm still working on uh, uh, world building for my Red Giant campaign for Shadow Dark. So couple things going on tomorrow night and thursday we have videos so we'll see you guys uh later as an ad break starts exactly when i'm gonna sign off <laughs> i love when that happens perfect uh... oh well can't do anything about it now no nope. 
I will talk to you guys later. Dave, thank you so much for being here. You have a great night. You too. All right.